as well. If the imaginary thrust line gets outside of the middle third of the wall, the wall might go into tension and want to lean over. If the line goes outside the boundary of the wall, the whole thing falls down. And in fact, in ancient walls, this happened far too often. Now, the simplest way of stopping it is to make the wall thick enough so that the thrust line always stays inside. That, of course, is our battered wall, or buttress. But there is another way to solve the problem of keeping the thrust line within the wall. If you push down more with a big weight, you actually force the thrust line to move in. That increases the compression in the wall and prevents it from falling over. This simple idea actually works. That's why buttresses had turrets, pinnacles or statues on the top. So as well as being part of the overall design, they kept the thrust line from straying outside that magic middle third. As the buildings got higher, or the spans wider, the buttresses had to stick out farther. But if the buttress is so far out that it blocks all the light, what use is it? The solution was to put holes in the buttresses so that light could pass through. This is what we call the flying buttress. The Gothic style of architecture was partly a process of adding material to hold things up, then taking some of it away in places where it wasn't really needed. A very important point to remember is that most structural systems up to a couple of hundred years ago relied solely on compression to hold themselves together. Really it was, by and large, the weight of pieces on top of one another that kept them from falling down. And this we have seen had important consequences for walls, especially stone or brick ones. You couldn't have a load that tried to stretch the wall on one of its sides, which is what happens when a wall is pushed out near the top. Walls could not bend because one of the sides of the wall would be in tension, just like a beam or a blade of grass. But while beams and grass can cope, a wall cannot. It just falls apart or falls down if it's made in a single piece. Oh, by the way, just an aside here about the mortar people use in their walls between the bricks or stones. Well, contrary to popular belief, mortar is not a glue. No, it just spreads the weight more evenly. It simply transfers the compression of one stone to the stones below. So when they didn't use mortar in the past, it was because the walls were better made, not worse. And yet we often think, oh, poor people, fancy having no mortar to build their walls with. Well, the fact remains, most of the time, they didn't need it. Even to this day, the great stones in the walls at Machu Picchu in Peru are so carefully and smoothly cut that you can't put a razor blade between them. They simply didn't need the mortar. Machu Picchu is very impressive. But if we want to build large, modern buildings, this technique of using compression only just won't work. The needs of the modern city spell the end of the load-bearing wall as the primary means of construction. Oh, you can still build using load-bearing walls in smaller buildings, and of course we do. But we immediately find a problem with a building that is built very high. If the walls are load-bearing, then they will be very, very thick at the bottom. These stresses that build up at the bottom are so high that you can't have any large openings in the walls. Well, of course, that's exactly the opposite of what you want in a downtown building. You want the biggest openings at ground level for shops. 
so we have to find another way. We can find a clue if we go back to our bearing wall system. What if we make walls so short in length that they just become posts in the corners? This can be done, and what we have is a post and beam building. The low bearing wall is replaced by a post at each end and a great big beam across the top. This is especially good for those buildings where we want the freedom to arrange or rearrange the interior walls any way we want, save for lots of small offices. Then the post and beam system comes into its own. But what is different about the way this system transfers its loads to the ground? Well, remember our diagram from episode two of the Teeter Totter? When we flip it upside down, we can see that when the load gets nearer to one column, the column has to be made bigger to handle the extra load. Now, this means that in a multi-story building using post and beam construction, the beams would stay the same size, but the posts should get bigger as you move towards the ground level of the building. Not an economical idea because the dimensions between the columns change as you change stories. They get narrower, and you end up needing different size windows for each floor. The solution is sometimes to have rows of smaller posts or columns closer together, and that are the same size all the way up the building, which is a more economical form of construction. Economy is also a major factor in designing the beams. Let me explain. When you have a row of three columns, say, you could have two beams from the left-hand post to the middle and the middle to the right. If you put a weight in the middle of one beam, it will bend a certain amount and not affect the other beam at all. But if it was just a single continuous beam over all three columns and you put a weight in the middle of one of the bays, it will still bend down, but the other part will bend up. How does that help us? Well, not yet. But what if we add a weight in the other bay? In the first example, both beams bend the same amount, but with the continuous beam, the downward bending is reduced because of the upward bending that now takes place on both sides. In other words, a more efficient beam, because it needn't be as deep as the separate beams, which saves money. Now, if you continue the beam past the end of the column a bit, you can increase the overall efficiency still further. This is called cantilevering. The load on the cantilever can reduce the bending in the rest of the beam by using the result of upward bending to work for us.